an ode to Dr. Seuss. I sat and I pondered a show about sleep. After counting 4,070 sheep, there must be other strategies for sleeping to find. There are, and we'll share them on the next Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. Sleep is foundational to our well being. So, if you're one of the millions of Americans who sleep poorly because of stress or mental health problems like anxiety or, or depression, or just because you've slept poorly for so long it feels like you don't remember how to sleep well, whatever the reason you're not sleeping, we have an important message for you we can all relearn how to get a good night's sleep. And who doesn't want to get a good night's sleep? So call in your questions about sleep locally, dial 218-788-2844, or call toll-free at 1-877-307-8762. We'll be answering your questions throughout tonight's show. My guest tonight is Todd Hegestead, a licensed psychologist at Essentia Health who works with people with insomnia and other medical health conditions. Thanks so much for joining us. And I need to explain before we get started to the viewing audience, my ode to Dr. Seuss. When I was four years old, the Dr. Seuss sleep book was my favorite bedtime story book and it's still near and dear to my heart. So that was kind of my homage to Dr. Seuss. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And I think a good place for us to start is what is what's even normal sleep uh, as a place for us to even know what normal sleep is so we can begin to know when we're not sleeping normally. Because I think, you know, I think of normal sleep as I want to get eight hours and I want it to be solid eight hours uh, and I want to do that most of my life. So if we look at normal sleep as being we get into bed, we're a little tired, we're able to fall asleep fairly readily within, well, within 30 minutes easily, sleep through the night without awakening or maybe a brief awakening, wake up eight hours later, refreshed, invigorated, get out of bed, ready to go. That's a normal night's sleep. But I think we also have to look at a normal night's sleep also includes waking up in the middle of the night at times because our normal sleep cycle is on a two hour rhythm and so waking up on occasion is okay. So the solid night's sleep, I think if we include that in as a normal night's sleep, sometimes gets us into trouble. Because we start building expectations then about what we want to be doing and then the minute we start building these expectations, we kind of start getting a little riled up maybe if we're not doing the sleep in the way that we want to do it optimally. Then we begin to be worried about sleep. Am I going to get enough sleep for tomorrow? I didn't sleep very well last night and the night before. I won't be able to function at work very well. So we begin to be stressed about sleep and then it morphs into a sleep problem. The, so let's d dive in then to sleep problems. Uh, insomnia being a, one of the largest sleep problems and most common sleep problems. So def first define insomnia for us. We can define insomnia as several things. One is a problem with being able to fall asleep, taking more than 30 minutes to fall asleep. Sometimes it's a difficulty with being able to stay asleep. Other times it's both, problems falling asleep and staying asleep. And another variation is early morning awakening and feeling like we haven't gotten a good night's sleep. And are there factors that predispose people to developing insomnia? Well, I think what I'm commonly seeing in the office is people who become stressed about not sleeping well. And so they're having a period of time of three days in a week over a three month period of time and it begins to be a pattern and having problems with sleep. You can have comorbid issues with depression, with anxiety, and that will oftentimes be a symptom, uh, the sleep will be a symptom of those disorders, and it sometimes just adds to the problems. And I think it can also start out as a symptom and Correct. then develop into its own nice little separate disorder all on, on, all on its own, so that once you 
actually treat the anxiety and the depression, they still have these chronic ongoing sleep problems and never seem to be able to get, you know, feel like I can't get back to the good sleeping that I used to have one, one point in time in my life. Right. With the assessment that I do, you never quite know what it's going to be, so you do a thorough assessment of what are the sleep issues, the sleep parameters, the con contributing factors, uh, what is the mental health status, uh, have there been some stresses occurring in life that are, uh, maybe they haven't had any corporate mental health problems, but it, it, that they've had some losses in life and such. So it can be quite varied in terms of what triggers the sleep problem. The, um, one of the things that I think about too is sleep hygiene. We hear a lot about sleep hygiene, and, and we hear a lot about that sort of in the popular media. Um, and the message that I sort of get from the popular media on this is that if we just all had some sleep good sleep hygiene that that would fix our sleep problems and I'd like you to talk a little bit uh, about that also so like what is the role of good sleep hygiene in um, fixing insomnia um, and what even good sl sleep hygiene is for those people who may not know what that is. So sleep hygiene refers to a variety of good things to do to help with sleep. It's being able to consistent sleep schedule. It's limiting caffeine. It's limiting alcohol before we go to bed. Um, it's not exercising before bed, potentially. It's limiting TV. It's having a room that's dark, uh, a bit cool, uh, having a nice mattress. Uh, those things are helpful for sleep. The way I look at sleep hygiene, it's a very good educational component to helping people with their sleep problems but it's typically not sufficient for helping people and deal with their sleep problems. It's nice, but not the complete answer. And so we do know that, um, that if you're drinking way too much caffeine, that that will interfere with your sleep. But simply, so what you're saying is, simply fixing the caffeine problem is not necessarily going to fix your I can't sleep problem. Correct. Um, so this is going to be like a multi-pronged, you're going to have a lot to do out there in order to get, we're all going to have a lot to do out there to get back to sleeping, to sleeping better. Um, the, I want to touch a little bit on, on the sleep hygiene for just a little bit longer. Are, are there specific tips about uh, no caffeine after which o'clock um, and, and how our brains work with that? So caffeine is a stimulant. Um, it's a popular drink and people like their coffee. Mm -hmm. The general recommendation that I know from the National Sleep Foundation is less than 250 milligrams of caffeine per day. So if you look at coffee, tea, and caffeinated pop beverages, that between the three that equals two or three beverages per day. It's not much. Caffeine, my understanding, has about a four to seven hour half-life. So depending on each person, how you metabolize it, Figure when you go to bed, go back seven hours to be safe, and that should be your last cup of coffee. That's typically what, around two o'clock? Maybe noon as your last cup of coffee? And, and there are a lot of people who, uh, in the afternoon, at work, around 2.30, getting a little tired, getting a little sleepy, boss doesn't really want you napping at work, and um, they take another hit of caffeine, right, to, to, get them, to get them going. And we ultimately believe for some people then that's going to create uh, problems in their ability to become sleepy later on at, at night when they want to go to bed then. So a sleep hygiene strategy would be if you're having difficulty with sleep, look at the caffeine, consider cutting it back or having your last cup of coffee earlier in the day. The, uh, now in my research for this show, uh, they talked a lot about sort of the three essential things for good sleep, and one was the concept of this drive for sleep and creating a drive for sleep. And, um, uh, you know, when, when I first heard that, I thought drive for sleep is like, well, we all have a drive for sleep. It's like, yeah, I want to sleep, but that's not what they mean by a drive for deep sleep. Um, so explain that for our viewing audience. So I'm going to describe it with a different term. I'm going to use the word a sleep rhythm. They're recognizing that sleep is a biological rhythm. And there's three rhythms tied into the biology of sleep. There is a wake, sleep, antagonistic homeostasis process, meaning that the more we're awake, the more we want to go to sleep. And the more sleep we get, the more we want to wake up. So there's that sleep-wake rhythm that's occurring. 
Sleep is also tied in with body temperature. Body temperature rises, dips mid-afternoon, rises till evening, and drops at night. A dip or drop in body temperature is a signal for sleep. So a sleep hygiene technique for that might be to take a warm bath or shower before you go to bed. Getting out of the bath or the shower, the body cools and helps trigger the sleep cycle. The other one is melatonin levels. Melatonin is a naturally produced hormone in the body. It's tied in with the light and dark cycle of the day. So with daylight, it's suppressed. With night, it's increased. So there is this biological rhythm within us that we have to, and I always use this word very specifically with my patients, is to honor the sleep biology. Because your body is your body. Yes. And it has a thing that it wants to do, and it's very good at doing it, and then we get in the way. Yes. We, we interfere and in thinking that, it's almost like thinking like I can do a better job than my body has it when my body's evolved to do this thing um, and take care, take care of us, right? Well, and then there's the times too where we sometimes resent nighttime because we got so much to do and I gotta get this done and if the day could just be longer, well, we push the day into the night without realizing that each of us has a certain amount of sleep that we need to feel best. And so it's honoring, again, what that sleep cycle is for us. The um, talk a little bit about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, because that is um, one of the best treatments I hear for insomnia. That's been recognized by the American College of Physicians as the first line go-to for dealing with sleep problems. Came out in the uh, Annuals of Internal Med in the July 2016 uh, journal. Cognitive behavior therapy is where we're looking at a person's thoughts, their beliefs about sleep, and helping them change those beliefs, those thoughts, to be more conducive with being able to fall back asleep and get a good night's sleep. And so what are the typical kinds of thoughts that people have then when they're having problems with insomnia and not being able to get back to sleep or even to fall asleep? A common one is waking up in the middle of the night and the notion of I'm losing sleep. Well, it tends to be a faulty premise. We can't really lose sleep. The notion there is you've got sleep when you go to bed and it's being taken away and we don't like losing anything. And so it creates for us then a negative emotion, an anger, and anger is an alerting emotion. Can you be angry and drowsy at the same time? It's just not possible. Or even anxiety, which is the same thing, anxiety right? Anxiety is an you alerting know. emotion. Yes, yeah, it's an yeah. alerting emotion, and, and you're sunk then, right? You've already, now, now you've sunk yourself. That's right, you, you're done, you're done for. And so changing that mindset, the cognitive behavior therapy fix for that, or that reframe for that, what I suggest to my patients is, we look at sleep as a gain process, in that when you go to bed, you start with zero, and you look at gaining sleep throughout the night. If we sleep in two hour intervals, which is a normal a rhythm for us, we get two hours of sleep, we wake up and we go, hey, I got two hours of sleep, yay. There's lots of night left, let's get some more. And so you accumulate sleep through the night, which keeps us in an emotionally neutral place rather than getting anxious or angry. I really like also just, you know, like even the tone you had when you said that of like, hey, I got this, like, let's get some more. And that's such a different tone than when I wake up and say, oh my gosh, <laughs> what if I don't get more? Right. Um, and so, or, or I need to get more now, now I need to get more. And so you have like even switching the tone of that can just sort of flip the switch in your head then. Right. So that's a cognitive reframe. It's changing the belief about sleep. It's letting a person look at the clock, realize there's plenty of time left to get more sleep. Two benchmarks I have for my patients is five hours and, s and seven. Five hours is how much we need to do okay. It's what's called core sleep. We're not fully recharged, but if we get five, we can muddle through the day as best as possible. So you get the five hours of sleep and you go, Ooh, I got my five. The rest is gonna be more restorative sleep. The general notion is we need about seven hours of sleep. Some people need nine or 10. And so you've got an idea what's, how much sleep you need 
and you just keep looking at the clock. I have people turn the clock around rather than turn it away. So they can look at it and accumulate that hour or half hour and work it towards their, their restorative sleep amount. The, what about w the, the phenomenon of I'm in the living room and I'm doing my quiet thing, so I'm getting, and now I'm falling asleep, um, and then I go upstairs and like I'm all relaxed and I'm calm and I'm not worried about things, and I get into bed and the light goes off and all of a sudden, Oof. boom, the, th awake. the thoughts. And I am, oh, I am wow. now, yeah, the thoughts, and I am absolutely wide awake now. Um, and so explain even that phenomenon of what's going on from that, that sort of, that really just tired, like I could have just fallen asleep in the chair to this, I'm laying in bed and I am now wide awake. Well, what we're doing is we're kind of moving up our sleep cycle an hour or so ahead of time. If we can, try as best we can to, to stay awake during that time in the living room, watching the TV and falling asleep so that we don't take one chunk that would be later in the, in the evening and, and move it earlier. Um, the racing thoughts is an interesting concept because people are in, thought, uh, in, in bed and thinking about the day, thinking about what they need to do the next day, and it serves as an interference for being able to settle and fall asleep. I work with people on being able to shift their thinking to a nighttime style of thinking, which is different than the daytime style. The nighttime style is more pleasant memories, comforting thoughts, and fantasy. And I take people through an example of how they can shift thoughts, and then we practice shifting thoughts so that the day thoughts they can just put to the side easily and then shift over to a nighttime style of thinking. And, and so over time with that kind of a practice, what we learn is that this is the wrong time for this thought. And I can, I can wake up in the morning and worry all I want. Like I get to do that, but this is like, oh, it's the wrong time for this, this thought. This is my time for sleep. This is my, yeah, this is my time for other, for, for nice thoughts. One of my patients years ago, a young woman who was a mother, realized that uh, she needed to be off the clock. And so she would, when she undressed to take off her clothes for the day and put on her pajamas, that was her signal to herself that the day is done now and I can get into my night mode. And it was a shift in terms of how she regarded that time. This is a pleasant time, this is a comforting time. I don't have to do all my mother duties or taking care of other people. I can be uh, rested just for myself. And that helped her then re get her, her sleep back on track. Right. Well, while we're talking about moms and kids, here is Peggy from Duluth said, four-year-old can't sleep at bedtime, what can we do to help her? Which is the greatest parent's lament, right? I have a kid who won't sleep, what can I do? Yeah. Well, I think establishing a routine with children. Uh, if there are fears or concerns, we can help address those with the child, kind of ask them what's going on. Um, the, the, the evening bath, the reading the book, I think the routine is, is probably is, is the most important and keeping a consistent schedule. And so w consistent schedule for kids, I want you to talk about importance of consistent schedule for adults as well. So looking at the biology of sleep, again, we are rhythmic creatures. And that rhythm helps us in a very healthy way. Anchoring your sleep schedule with the morning wake up time is the foundation, because that helps set that 24 hour clock for us. Then you're gonna go back the five hours, the seven, eight hours to figure out when your sleep time should be. And work in about a 15 minute to a half hour pre-sleep time where you basically say, I'm done with the day now, and you transition into night. And so if I want to have seven hours of sleep and I'm getting up at 5.30 in the morning, then you just do the math backwards from that. Correct. I love, you know, on my, on my iPhone, on my iPhone, on my little clock app, it says if you want to get this much sleep, this is the time. It's, it goes ding dong, it's time for that bedtime routine. Right. Um, which is kind of a, that's kind of sort of a neat electronic thing that we've got going in this day and age. Uh, in 2017. So 
that's all fine and good, and I don't mind getting up at 5.30 in the morning on the work week, but I gotta tell you, Todd, when it comes to the weekend, I don't wanna get up at five, like 5.30 does not seem like a weekend time to me. And so how- Me either, do, by the do, way. Okay, <laughs> so that's normal. So, so yeah. I'm doing okay with that idea, but how much leeway can I give myself on the weekend? Zero leeway, do I get any leeway? Yes, you get plenty of leeway. Okay. So if we have a, a, a morning we wanna sleep in, you know, that, that's one of the, the luxuries of life and, it, and it's really nice to be able to do that. If there's an, a night that we stay up later, that's fine. Uh, one bad night's sleep doesn't mean anything. Two bad nights of sleep doesn't mean anything. It's really a pattern over a several month period of time that is really telling. The, 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 the metaphor that I use for this is, 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 is in thinking about machinists who are milling things to a thousandth of an inch, very, very precise. If sleep was machinist work, the tolerance would be an inch, very large, it'd be huge. So I get to sleep in yes. on Saturday and Sunday. This is like, I am so glad that I am sitting here with Todd and hearing that news. I am waiting for Saturday morning. Now, if you have a sleep problem, yes. now I'm gonna want you to get up at the same time, most days, day after day, to get that sleep rhythm back in sync. And it typically takes about four to eight weeks to get a sleep rhythm back in sync, and then you can start to let it slide a little bit, but for the most part, we're on track week after week, month after month. So I like what you said though, which is if I'm way off track and I've, if I've been off track for a while, there I'm gonna have to do some things really differently to get back on track. And that's kind of part of, of the acceptance of how much do you want to change your sleep mm -hmm. and having some acceptance about that, that you're gonna need to do some things differently. And we've been working on acceptance all season here. So, so that's what you're saying too, is that I might get more leeway later on, but you're going to want me to be pretty tight about some things because, because I'm the one who's coming in number one and complaining that I'm not sleeping, and so I should have half a mind to listen to you then. Here's another question. Um, the wondering about the opinions of blue screen shields for electronic devices, and A, do they work, and B, should you use them? So my understanding is that the blue light and the spectrum of light helps in train the sleep rhythm, which means to help set the sleep rhythm. There's a study I read um, from a Japanese researcher who looked at blue light as a way of setting the sleep cycle, and if you got that exposure of light in the morning, it helped get you in sync. Well, these days our digital devices have blue light to them, and we're looking at them at night before we go to bed. So the brain is going, wait a minute, is this morning or is this evening? And so if we have a blue light blocker on that, that keeps the brain from being confused by what time of day is it. So you're saying, you're, you're a solid yes on the blue screen blocker. Then. Yes. Okay, there, there you go. Go get a blue screen blocker for all your devices then? Or they have like little, funny little blue screen glasses then too. Yeah, they, they do. So perhaps the best solution is turn them off mid evening, do something else, Oh, I Re like read, that. Read a real book. Read a real book. <laughs> read a real book. There's, there's, a, there's a great thought. We are running short on time. And so what would, what would you say your parting words would be for uh, our American viewing audience out there and um, anybody else who's watching, if you're American or not, um, what, what, what are the parting words? Well, I think having a consistent sleep schedule goes a long way for people. Um, Keep it consistent as much as possible. If you look at sleep as a gain process, it'll take the stress out of the picture, hopefully, and you'll be able to enjoy good sleep. I think those are wonderful words to live by, and the words I'm going to live by as well is that I get to sleep in on Saturday. Uh -huh. And as my friend Dr. Seuss would say, believe you can sleep. Go ahead, change your mind. Just do it each night at the same o'clock time. Thanks so much for joining the discussion. Before we stop, I do want to send out from all of us here, our heartfelt compassion to the people in New York who are suffering 
um, from the latest uh, terrorist attack there to all of the victims there, to the families of survivors, to the survivors, and to all you people just living in New York. Our hearts are with you. Don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links. Join us next week when we'll be talking about the eating disorder bulimia nervosa. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.